great joy that I greet you on behalf of NG Welterfreden in Johannesburg, South Africa. I'm honored and excited to be part of this wonderful congregation. You are welcome and I thank you for joining me today. I greet you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, as we get gather together, we praise you for this day and your purpose with it. Reset our agendas as we sit in your presence. For you assure us that where two or more gather in your name, you are here. Recalibrate our intentions and refocus our hearts. Your will for our lives does not always reflect our plans. Change them to reflect your will. Help us to understand that we don't need full clarity to walk into the unique purpose you've inlaid in our lives. Lift our eyes to seek you first, today and always, surrendering your need to achieve, understand and be known. Shift our perspective to seek your peace above all else. In every situation, we ponder in our daily lives. Let the Holy Spirit translate your commands. Give us renewed strength and godly courage to obey you without questioning. Forgive us for striving beyond our means, worrying and forcing the results. Only you know what lies ahead. You are, you are our God, Father, just and righteous. Though our circumstances will be unfair from time to time in this life, you are always our unwavering protector and shield. Keep the words of King David fresh in our minds and renew our hearts to the tune of your truth. I lie down and sleep, I wake again, because the Lord sustains me. Let your peace rain down on us today as we seek your name more than anything else. In Jesus' name, Amen. Let's praise the Lord. Lift your name on high Lord, I love to sing your praises I'm so glad you're in my life I'm so glad you came to save us You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross my debt to pay from the cross to the grave from the grave to the sky Lord I lift your name on high Lord I lift your name on high Lord, I love to sing your praises I'm so glad you're in my life I'm so glad you came to save us You came from heaven to earth To show the way from the earth to the cross my debt to pay from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on high. pray together before we read from the Bible. Father, Son and Holy Spirit, holy is your word, perfect are your ways. Let us be blessed by your word today as we meditate on your precepts. 
Your promises are true. Your word is faithful. Let me walk in the path of your word today. I pray the words of my mouth come from your truth. Let our thoughts be governed by your commandments. Please bless this day as we seek to dwell in your word today. Amen. How would we live if we know God was living amongst us? and that we could meet him in the checkers or bump into him on our way to buy milk. Would that have changed our actions? Joan Osborne sang a song and asked the question, What if God was one of us, just a slop like one of us, just a stranger on the bus, trying to make his way home? If God had a name, what would it be? And would you call it to his face? If you were faced with him in all his glory, what would you ask if you had just one question? And then she answers, God is great. God is good. With that in mind, let's read from Mark 10. Mark 10 verses 35 to 45, the New King James um, translation. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him, saying, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? They said to him, Grant us that we may sit, one on your right hand and the other on your left, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They said to him, We are able. So Jesus said to them, You will indeed drink the cup that I drink, and with the baptism I am baptized, with you will be baptized. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but is for those for whom it is prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be greatly displeased with James and John. But Jesus called them to himself and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them, and the great ones exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant, and whoever of you desires to be first shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Mark 10 offers several reasons why we should be servants in our community, in our work environment, and in the neighborhood in which God has placed us. Jesus said that he did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. But what took place before Jesus said those words? Why did Jesus break into a seemingly impromptu speech on servanthood? A few verses before in Mark 10, 32 to 34, the disciples and Jesus are walking to Jesus' neighborhood in Jerusalem. He's explaining what is going to happen to him there. I've got some news for you. The religious leaders are going to arrest me. They are going to mock me. They are going to spit upon me. They are going to kill me. Three days later, I am going to come back from the dead. This is the opposite of smug segue. Jesus tells them he is going to be put to death. In verse 35, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, ask Jesus to let them have whatever they ask for. Just like a little kid says, Hi, Mum, just say yes, just say yes, please. These disciples ask for permission ahead of time. What do you want me to do for you? He asked. They replied, Let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. Talk about being presumptuous. James and John felt they deserved seats of honor. I'm so glad none of us ever worry about things like that. We never worry about the corner office. We never ask to be first. We never want our favorite choice of dinner. Actually, we are just like these two guys. Jesus looks back at them and says, You guys don't know what you're asking. 
Do you drink the cup that I drink? Anytime you see the word cup in the New Testament, it's always a picture of life or death. Nevertheless, James and John say, Oh, we can do that. Yet Jesus says to them, That's really not for me to grant. Bear in mind that this conversation is not just between two brothers. There are ten eavesdropping followers of Jesus nearby. For that reason, Jesus launches into an extemporaneous speech about service because he wants to make it crystal clear that his disciples are to put others first. Service looks so distinctive, so countercultural, that when you serve, people take notice that there is something different about you and that you march to the beat of a different drum. Why should we take the culture we have at church of volunteering and serving others and infuse that into our neighborhood? To begin with, one Christian author writes, more than any other single way, the grace of humility is worked into our lives through the discipline of service. I want to give you four more reasons why you should serve. Serving prompts un unity. First, serving prompts unity. Anytime you take the focus of self and place it on others, you are humbling yourself. The foundation of unity is humility. Jesus says in Matthew 23 verses 11 to 12, The greatest among you will be your servant, for whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. If you are arrogant, then your service is a waste. That's why the psalm says, Serve the Lord with gladness. So use your gift to His glory. Look for ways to be a servant at work. Do things without being asked. Your labors of love count eternally. They can build unity within your neighborhood. There's another reason for serve. Serving fosters teamwork. I enjoy trying to look for ways to build relationships. Serving can take a relationship and add the glue to it that is so necessary. Service is an expression of grace to someone, an undeserved gift that we give to others, a cameo of the gospel. In fact, service is the language of grace. But you have to be ready to step up and serve at the drop of a hat. Jesus always looked for those opportunities. And we have to have eyes and ears that are always on the lookout and always listening for whatever needs might arise in our neighborhood. We have to be ready to respond. When we serve, we realize how much we need each other. Peter said in 1 Peter 4, each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others faithfully, administrating God's grace in its various forms. There are so many Christians who use all sorts of excuses. Well, I can do anything in my neighborhood. Can you bake? Can you landscape? Can you water flowers while your neighbors are away on vacation? While you're taking your two-mile walk every morning, can you stop and give them a smile and take an interest in their life? There's a third reason we should serve. Serving imitates Jesus. You want people to see His reflection in your life. That's why your example is so important. Example is not the best way of teaching. Albert Schweitzer once said, It is the only way. So guard your example. People in your neighborhood are watching everything that you do. They are watching to see how you live. In time, hopefully, they will learn that you have fallen in love with a person named Jesus Christ and He has transformed your life. You must always watch your example because others are watching. John 13 illustrates Jesus' concern with service. It was just before the Passover feast and Jesus, and Jesus intended to talk about and show His disciples' love. At this time, Judas Iscariot was still there. 
He had not left to bring the religious leaders and soldiers to arrest Jesus. They had already sat down for the meal, but it had become quite obvious that some was conspicuously absent. The servant boy, who typically sat at, front, at the front door, whose job was to wash the feet of the dinner guest, was nowhere to be found. Maybe it was because it was Passover and he was observing the meal with his family. Whatever the reason, no one washed their feet as they came in. In fact, while all of this was going on, the disciples were discussing which of them would be considered the greatest. Different place, different time, and yet the disciples revert to arguing over who is the greatest. This is like a grade school boys rugby team arguing over who is the greatest. Simon Peter is saying, well, you know what guys, I'm the guy that came up with a good confession. And I'm the guy who walked on water. His brother Andrew says, you know what I found Peter? I think that Jesus is much more into humility. He values that over being an obnoxious person who always wants everyone's attention. James and John chime in. You know what? We're the sons of thunder. We could start a family dynasty. There are two of us. We are the greatest. Everybody chimed in one at a time. How do you think the disciples felt as each of them was stooping his own horn and in their own pre prayer vision? They saw someone kneeling and taking off his outer garment, only to realize that the guy with the towel and basin of water was the one they believed to be the God's son. He puts his servanthood into action since he had given this speech before but it has fallen on deaf ears. He concluded the lesson by adding the phrase, Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do these things. Here's the Son of God going from person to person, washing feet, dirty and smelly, clothed and cracking. Have you ever been to a food washing service? How would you feel if I told you today to wash the person next to your feet? How would you feel if I tell you the next person you meet, you must wash that person's feet? I'm just kidding. But take yourself back when for a split second you really thought that something bizarre must happen. My words triggered that emotion of uneasiness. You were uneasy because either you didn't want to handle the feet of another person or you didn't want them to see your feet or probably both. But it doesn't matter which camp you fall into. It made you feel uneasy because either of them have the same root cause, the fact that we want to preserve our dignity. It is, it's a pride issue. We don't want to wash someone else's feet. And we certainly don't want someone to wash ours. No matter which camp you fell into, you need to realize that serving by its very nature is neither glamorous nor glorious. To leave your dignity at the door because it's not about you, it's about him and it's about others. Every time you serve, every time you do a modern day equivalent of washing feet, you are imitating Jesus. In time, the people in your neighborhood may start to see the resemblance if you serve the way Jesus Christ served. Have you ever wondered how your servant's heart could soften hearts to, to that that it would be open to the gospel? Jesus said in Matthew 23 verse 12, Whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled. Richard Foster says, There is a difference between choosing to serve and choosing to be servant. When I choose to serve, I retain control about whom I serve and when I serve. But when I choose to be a servant, I have given up all rights and all control. 
In other words, service is not about adding another activity to our schedules. It's about fleshing out servanthood in our neighborhoods where God has placed us. Let me offer you one more reason why we should serve. Serving changes you. Your attitude, if you serve out of compulsion, will be sour. There will be no benefit from that. You'll be the same person you always were. You'll serve for the wrong reasons. But if you serve with an attitude of love, and if you sense that Christ is the one who is receiving the glory, then the sky is the limit for what you can accomplish, and you will earn the right to be heard. It was Francis of Assisi who said, Preach the gospel at all times, if necessary, use words. When you begin to serve others outside of your walls, you will never be the same. I want to remind you of one more biblical truth. Jesus lives in your neighborhood. He lives in the form of that person who needs to be touched by you, who needs to be served by you. Jesus is a latchkey kid who just needs somebody to play catch with him. Jesus is an elderly widow who is dying of loneliness. Jesus is that young couple who would give anything for a person with a healthy marriage to come over and encourage them and say, you know what, you can make it through this. It's okay, we will help you. Jesus said in Matthew 25, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did it for me. Jesus Christ is in your neighborhood and is waiting for you to reach out and serve him. He's waiting for you to choose to be a servant, not to serve just when it's convenient, but to serve when you are called to be his follower. Amen. Let's pray together. Oh, Heavenly Father, give me a heart like the heart of Jesus, a heart more ready to serve than to be served a heart moved by compassion towards the weak and oppressed, a heart to set upon the coming of your kingdom in the world of men and women. Amen. There is now opportunity to give thanks to our God through offering. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen.